Hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and I'm here for another session in our studies in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. In this session, we're going to take up a preliminary context for the wasteland. Uh, I try to minimize this sort of thing, but we really do need this background before we can launch into the poem proper to understand some of the sources and influences that went into the making of this celebrated poem, the most influential poem in English in the 20th century. I'm going to begin with some allusions that went into the wasteland. Uh, we recall that T.S. Eliot called himself a classicist in literature. And what this seemed to mean in practice is that T.S. Eliot ransacked the literatures of the past in various languages. He was genuinely multicultural. Uh, in order to find fragments that are still living and vital and useful and valuable in our own time in this modern world. We could begin with the allusions to classical antiquity. This would include reference to the Aeneid of Virgil, the great epic of the Roman Empire in its heyday, a poem that was also a tribute to the Emperor Augustus. Uh, we could include the Satyricon of Petronius that showed the Roman Empire, still at its height, but in a state of decadence. Uh, this work was written a generation or so after the crucifixion of Jesus. And we would have to include in these allusions to antiquity of vital importance were his references to sacred writ. I would cite three things in particular the Upanishads and Vedas of ancient Hindu worship, uh, the references to the Buddha and Buddhism. Uh, part four of the wasteland is called the Fire Sermon, named after the Buddha's own fire sermon delivered to his monks. When we get to part four, we will have a closer look at the Buddha's fire sermon. And we have references to the Christian and Hebrew Bible, the Old and New Testament. Uh, references to the Gospels, references to the Old Testament prophets, and to other writings in the Holy Bible. Now these writings of sacred writ have a special significance in the wasteland. They represent this ongoing structure in Eliot's verse of poetry as a quarrel with oneself, or as Faulkner put it, the heart in conflict with itself. In Eliot's case, the, this poem continues the ongoing conflict between a naturalistic intellect that tells him this is the way the world is, we have to live with it, and this yearning for something better, which I think we could associate with Eliot's religious sensibility, undermining to some degree, or at least in combat with the naturalistic intellect of the poet. Other sources or allusions from more recent times would include Shakespeare, uh, T.S. Eliot cites Hamlet, Coriolanus, Anthony and Cleopatra, and The Tempest. There are references to Dante, particularly The Inferno. And Eliot did claim that Dante and Shakespeare divide the world, there is no third. There are references to the French symbolist writers that I've referred to in earlier lectures, particularly to Baudelaire. Charles Baudelaire, around 1850, 
uh, published The Flowers of Evil, in which he portrayed the city of Paris as a sort of hell for our own time. Eliot was much impressed by that imagery and used it to create his city of London around the year 1920 in a similar mode as Baudelaire's Paris. There's also some reference and certainly some influence of Ezra Pound as a poet who, who influenced the formative years of T.S. Eliot in matters of style and form. There is reference to Charles Dickens in The Wasteland. The original title of this poem was He Do the Police in Different Voices, a citation from one of Dickens's novels. And uh, there are very important uses of music in the wasteland. There is reference to popular music. I think the most powerful musical allusion is to Richard Wagner's great opera of erotic love, Tristan and Isolde, an opera that T.S. Eliot attended with his friend Jean Verdinal before World War I. Now of the allusions in the wasteland, I think the most important or certainly ranking with the most important would be T.S. Eliot's studies in anthropology, here defined particularly as his ransacking of what in modern times might be referred to as primitive religions. I'm going to quote what Eliot said in his notes to the wasteland uh, for this source of allusions, anthropology. In the first edition of The Wasteland, there were no notes. And Eliot came to realize that his readers simply had to have more information in order to understand the poem. So in all subsequent editions of The Wasteland, he added these notes, which indeed are extremely useful in helping us understand the poem, I would say essential, and which became part of the poem the wasteland in later editions. The very first note of these notes to the wasteland, indeed the first sentence of these notes, reads as follows. Not only the title, but the plan and a good deal of the incidental symbolism of the poem were suggested by Miss Jessie L. Weston's book on the Grail legend, The Search for the Holy Grail. Uh, the name of the book, From Ritual to Romance. In addition, this first note to the wasteland gives credit to another source of allusions. I read his statement as follows. To another work of anthropology, I am indebted in general one which has influenced our generation profoundly. I mean the Golden Bow. I have used especially the two volumes, Adonis, Otis, Osiris. Now I'm going to read what T.S. Eliot said about the Golden Bow, this immense collection of anthropological studies. It was directed by Sir James Fraser, who compile, compiled the work of scores of other anthropologists studying primitive religions in these many volumes of the Golden Bough. About that masterwork, T.S. Eliot said the following in a letter he wrote to The Dial magazine in November 1921 a time when he was busy writing The Wasteland. He said this, The Golden Bough can be read two ways, as a collection of entertaining myths, or, Eliot's way, as a revelation of that vanished mind 
of which ours is a continuation. Which is to say, he hoped to find in these primitive religions the genesis of the religious sensibility in humankind. Perhaps if he could tap into that, he could bring forward some vital segments of religious thinking, religious experience that would be valid in our own time, even in this naturalistic environment. We'll turn now to Jesse Weston's book, From a Ritual to Romance. Uh, Miss Weston was one of the anthropologists who helped Sir James Fraser uh, when he was assembling the Golden Bough. But she went her own way with this book, From Ritual to Romance. I hold up a copy here. Um, this book was written about a single myth from antiquity, the search for the Holy Grail. Now, most of us think of that as a Christian myth. The Holy Grail, after all, was the cup used by Jesus in his Last Supper, and it became the object of much attention in the King Arthur legends of the Middle Ages. For Jesse Weston, as she dug into the story of the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail turned out to be much older than Christianity. It goes back to remote antiquity, where she describes its origins in these same primitive religions that uh, prevailed in other parts of the Golden Bough. I'm going to quote from her table of contents, where she described what goes on in each chapter of From Ritual to Romance. And I think the reason she singled out this particular myth, the search for the Holy Grail as the center of her attention, the exclusive object of her attention in this book, is because of an assertion in this introductory chapter quoting what she says in the introductory material, not death, but resurrection, the essential center of ritual. Which is to say that the search for the Holy Grail is the search for a myth of rebirth, the most important myth in any society, whether it's traditionally religious or secular and even naturalistic. Now, I'll explain that comment by pointing first to, of course, the traditional religious connection to the search for the Holy Grail. Uh, we think uh, of uh, the Holy Grail in Christian terms as Jesus' cup at the Last Supper, leading to his death and resurrection, providing rebirth for all his followers. In secular terms, that supernatural intervention is no longer possible. But even so, the ideologies of modern times have promised a kind of rebirth for the followers of those ideologies. I would refer particularly to Marxism, as we looked at it in Gerontion, the March of History. Marxism, Bolshevism, fascism and the others, offered the chance to enlist one's life in the building of a better society, aiming really towards a perfect society. And this could uh, afford a meaningful life even in a naturalistic world. Some kind of myth of rebirth needs to be necessary for any society to have a meaningful existence. That is why the Holy Grail seemed to be so important to Miss Weston and to T.S. Eliot as he read this book. My own impression is that T.S. Eliot, uh, as the editor of the Criterion magazine for about 20 years, from 1919 until World War II ended it in 1939, T.S. Eliot's role as editor meant that he got to review 
many books written by other people, and among them was this book, From Ritual to Romance, which I believe transformed this poem he was working on from He Do the Police in Different Voices to The Wasteland. That title comes from this book. In chapter two of Jesse Weston's book, From Ritual to Romance, the subtitle is The Task of the Hero. She goes on and explains that the task of the hero, searching for the Holy Grail, is the healing of the Fisher King and the removal of curse, the curse from the waste land. The Fisher King in these legends from antiquity has been wounded in a way that obliterates his fertility and thereby the entire kingdom has lapsed into a wasteland. They are waiting for a hero to come to the wasteland and by asking the right questions, the, uh, he will heal the king, restore his fertility, and thereby make the entire wasteland fertile. As we move on in Jesse Weston's book, chapter three is called The Freeing of the Waters. Here she goes back to ancient Hindu sacred writ, the Rig Veda, and in her language, the extreme importance assigned to Indra's feat of freeing the waters, which is to say every spring, uh, the god Indra uh, arranges the coming of the monsoons necessary for life in that part of the world. In part five of the wasteland, we will have a few drops of rain as people wait in that very drought ridden environment. Chapter four of Jesse Weston's book, Tammuz and Adonis is a subtitle, describes Tammuz as the earliest known representative of the dying God, the sacrificial God, a scapegoat, providing life for his people by his own death. A later version of this myth is Adonis, and of course, eventually we'd come to Jesus filling the same role of sacrificial death to bring life to his people. Uh, I move to chapter nine, the Fisher King. There is some such figure in the wasteland in part five, I sat fishing on the shore and so forth. And Jesus is described as a sort of fisher king. I will make you fishers of men, he told his disciples. The fish became the symbol of the Christian faith uh, for centuries before the cross displaced it. In this chapter nine, the fisher king, uh, Jesse Wesson explains that the fish is a life symbol. She, go back, she goes back to ancient India where the god Vishnu appeared in the form of a fish to help his people. She describes the use of the fish in Buddhism. And of course, she mentions the messianic fish meal adopted by Christianity. The last chapter of From Rit Ritual to Romance is called The Perilous Chapel. And uh, this refers to the knight's quest for the Holy Grail, bringing him into close contact with death. In the par uh, in chapter, excuse me, in part five of the wasteland, we get something of this chapel perilous in the form of the empty chapel. It's a gutted ruin now. It's empty because the lack of faith in the wasteland means that the chapel represents a faith no longer believed in. Nonetheless, it is there, perhaps waiting to be revived eventually via the conversion of T.S. Eliot. I'm going to quote now from the very last paragraph of Jesse Weston's book about the search for the Holy Grail, which I think we could 
understand as a search for a myth of rebirth that any society needs and which is lacking in Eliot's wasteland, a reason why it is a wasteland. This is what Jesse Weston says as her final commentary in this book. Of this one thing, we may be sure, the grail is a living force. It will never die. It may indeed be, sink out of sight for centuries even and disappear from the field of literature, but it will rise to the surface again and become once more a theme of vital inspiration, even as, after slumbering from the days of Mallory, the King Arthur stories, it woke to new life in the 19th century, making its fresh appeal through the genius of Tennyson, particularly in Idols of the King, and Wagner, that great composer. We could also add that the Holy Grail, of course, reappeared in the 20th century in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. Now I want to close with a look at some of the symbols that T.S. Eliot derived from this book, which he used in the wasteland. And the symbols I'm thinking of are in this deck of cards, the Tarot Pack, which Jesse Weston describes in her book. This is a deck of cards. It was 78 cards originally. It emerged through the Middle Ages, though its genesis really goes back thousands of years before the time of Jesus in some form or other. The purpose of the Tarot deck, as it originally uh, was generated, was not to gamble, but to predict the future. And I'm going to now hold up this um, set of cards from the Tarot deck, which I hope to explain individually in a moment. Uh, in the file that I've included with these lectures, there is this picture, which you can consult if you choose. The cards in the deck that Miss Weston describes in her book would include the search for the Holy Grail, the knight sitting under a tree seeing a vision of the Grail uh, as he tries to uh, go in search of it. We have also in the Tarot deck this symbol, the man with three staves will show up in part one of the wasteland. He is a merchant. He's looking out at the sea where it appears that a ship carrying his merchandise, it's on its way. We have the tower in part five. You can see that uh, there is a thunderstorm at work here, flashes of lightning, something like the chapel perilous in the middle of it. Uh, a, a, an image that will show up in part five of the wasteland. We have here the hanged man, a very important symbol. In Denmark, uh, we had uh, figures who um, were discovered in the peat bog who were preserved in the peat and found with ropes around their neck. They were obviously sacrifices, sacrificial scapegoats for their community, presumably their deaths bringing some sort of benefit, some extension of life perhaps, to the community. If this card comes up when you're hoping to have your fortune told, uh, you are in very bad shape and perhaps it is best that we lay this aside quickly. The last two cards that I want to show from the Tarot deck would be this card, the Wheel of Fortune. It's important not because of the fortune, but because of the wheel, which T.S. Eliot considered the most fundamental design of nature, uh, the wheel turning, whether it's planets going around the sun, are the great galaxies wheeling around a great black hole at the center, or 
we could go from that macrocosmic view to our individual lives, where the circulation of blood in one's body represents the turning wheel of nature. He also evokes in this image the wheel of time, turning something vitally important throughout T.S. Eliot's poetry. There is one other image I'll hold up. This is called the world. It too features the shape of a wheel, the basic design of nature, and a subject that he would take up as he goes on through to the end of four quartets. Now I think this will suffice for our preliminary context of the wasteland. In our next session, we'll go on with the poem itself.